Uh, we are very uh, lucky today to have Jorgen Richter Gebert, who's the chairman for uh, geometry and visual visualization at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, he was in New York City not so long ago, but he is back in Germany at the current time. And many of you probably know him for his work, uh, for his books on realization spaces of polytopes, his other book on automated deduction and geometry, and maybe also for uh, helping and uh, popularizing and developing uh, Cinderella. Before I start sharing uh, slides, let me say briefly something uh, about how all that happened. So uh, actually, it, I'm talking about uh, a result, uh, which is joint work with three other co-authors, I will mention them in a second, uh, that more or less totally came as a surprise. It started uh, on my side, actually by looking for some uh, literature for that I needed for a bachelor student. Then I was browsing through papers, saw a conjecture, and that conjecture was somehow solvable, but it turned out to be just the beginning of a much bigger story. And in a strange way, this story kept four people busy over the last couple of months, and we're still not, not finished. By now, we wrote about 90 pages on, on that uh, <laughs> subject, and we're uh, constantly uh, so it's kind of cell decomp decomposition you start a paper then it gets longer then you have to decide okay you have to divide it in two papers currently it will most probably become three papers so you see two names in uh, uh, in the title of uh, this thing uh, when Krumbaum meets Poncelet uh, because it connects somehow Poncelet's theorem from 1822 to configurations of Brunbaum from 1990. Uh, and, and we were surprised that there was a connection at all. And it uh, will, will end up with some pretty flexible things. So uh, the whole thing is joint work with Lea Brent Berman, uh, Gabor Gewey, and Sergei Terbachnikov. Uh, we come from more or less three different directions. So uh, Lea and Gabor are experts on configurations. Sergei is an expert on uh, Poncelet theorem and geometry in billiards, which will play a role later on. Uh, and I'm also on the computer on the computational side and on the dynamic side of the problem. And as I said, everything started with a picture and I will structure that talk into eight pictures. So I will start each chapter more or less with a picture and uh, then uh, explain what is behind that picture. And so our first picture uh, that we will then see is this uh, this picture of the conjecture, but I first want to roughly uh, give you an outline of what you can expect from that talk. So while we worked on all that, we went through very different phases. So there was a starting point. Then we were uh, working on the 21-4 configuration of points and lines. And then suddenly there was a, a connection to Porcelet. Uh, then we recognized that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And we were looking for a proof for the bigger theorem. And it turned out to be really nasty and difficult, but now we're pretty sure that we have our proof. Uh, then we saw, well, elliptical, uh, so billiards on an elliptic table plays a role in that context. And actually as a very end point, uh, circle nets and certain line configurations played the role and all that happened. So for me, it started actually at the end of April. And uh, here are just a few pictures that, uh, played a role in that context. Uh, and you can expect to find many pictures and animations, but only few formulas in that talk. So uh, if you want to see formulas, uh, I can show you the paper, but I think the main story happens on the pictorial side and not on the formula side. So uh, let us start with this picture and first of all let me explain what you're seeing here you see 21 points that's a reason why this configuration is called a 21 something configuration and you see that uh, there are also some lines and if you count these lines uh, then you see 
that there are also 21 lines and that on each line are exactly four points. That is the four that you see here. And uh, dually through each point, there are exactly four uh, lines. And you see uh, there are also three conics and these three conics will play a very essential role. And most of you will have seen realizations of 21.4 before, but you most surely uh, will not have seen this realization, also not up to uh, projective transformation, because this is really something that we only discovered recently that such things exist. And what these things are, I will explain in a minute. So this comes from a paper of Gabor, uh, which I was browsing through when I came into that game, uh, where he says, well, uh, it looks as if so. We have a strong numerical evidence that you can realize this 21 4 uh, configuration, which is combinatorially unique, in a way such that, uh, well, these uh, seven points, the seven red points are on a conic, the seven green points are on a conic, and the seven blue points are on a conic. And if two of them are on conics and the last one, then everything will close up and everything, uh, the last, uh, the last uh, seven points will automatically lie on a conic. And so he had strong numerical evidence. And he says, well, if this is the case, then the uh, greenbaum rigby configuration, this, this is 21.4, is way more flexible than we thought. I browsed through that paper and thought, Thought, okay, let, let's try to prove it. And I, it was actually on while I was traveling uh, by train through Germany. And at the end of the train ride, I had some configuration, but no, some construction for that, but still no proof that it was flexible that came, came later. Uh, but let me go a little bit back in history to see where those configurations actually come from and where they are first mentioned. So uh, the earliest mention of this specific configuration uh, goes back as far as I know to Klein. That was the earliest thing that I could found uh, where he has uh, one of his very important uh, papers uh, from 1887 uh, about that uh, particular equation where he studies singularities and inflection lines. And then he says, uh, well, uh, we get uh, 21 substitutions. Each of them correspond to one of 21 axes with 21 uh, corresponding centers, uh, such that uh, each of them uh, here, uh, each axis has uh, four points on it and vice versa. So this is first mentioning of this configuration. But if you study Klein's paper, you find out that the coordinates that come from this equation here are purely complex. So that what he's talking about is uh, something that doesn't exist in real space. And it took over a hundred years until Grünbaum and John Rigby uh, published a paper, which I think is a famous paper uh, in 1990, where they gave a real arrangement with exactly the same combinatorics. So, and the cookie, cooking recipe for that was, well, start with six points on a heptagon and then draw well certain connecting lines and certain uh, points of intersections between those lines and then you will get this configuration and they give a proof that everything actually nicely works out so one way to think of that configuration is uh, as having three nested star shaped polygons uh, so one between red and green, one between green and blue, and one between red and blue. And this comes with a certain combinatorics. And in Krunbaum's notion, this thing has a certain name. It's a seven hash two one three two one three. I will explain you how to read that symbol because we will need it later. Uh, so the two here means, uh, say, start with the red points and uh, don't connect one point to its next one, but to its second next one. So the two means make a skip of one, 
two and connect these two points and do that for each of those points, then you get the line. And then one way to read it, find green points on those lines such that here's the one. If you connect the next point, you get the same lines. So the two one is a combinatorics here between red and green. And the three two is a combinatorics between uh, green and uh, and blue. So uh, it means take the green points, skip three, and then find blue points such that uh, you have a skip two here. And then you get from the uh, blue to the red by skipping one, taking the next point, and finding the red point such that they are a skip three. And Grunbaum Rigby's construction says this closes up nicely. So imagine this, this is really a construction sequence. So uh, you start with seven points on a heptagon. And then the sequence tells you exactly what to do. At the end, you end up with new red points. And in that specific case, they are actually the red points you started with. So there is a serum behind that. So, uh, and ever since then, uh, the only drawings that I saw of that configuration were those coming from a regular hexagon, uh, heptagon. And, uh, only in Gaber's paper, I saw some something where uh, these points here were not placed regularly. And uh, so the reason that you could them place them in a non-regular way uh, hinted in the direction, okay, there must be some flexibility in that configuration. Uh, and so this is our first configuration here and this is just drawn by copying it from that paper and uh, then I started wiggling around with these points so uh, let let me explain what I did here I co copied those red points from Gabor's paper and then I drew those connection lines everything worked out nicely but uh, if you see, uh, there are too many incidences in that picture. Uh, you cannot force them all at once. So I had, to, I had to make a choice which of them I take. And then I started to wiggle with these points and then look what happens. So if I start to change that point here, you see the incidences break apart. So only for very, very specific positions of those points, this actually gives a Grunbaum Rigby configuration or a 21-4 configuration. And the question then is, uh, well, how many degrees of freedom does this have? have? Uh, how can you determine the positions of the points? And though I started playing with that configuration and uh, playing a bit, it looks as if five points on the red conic can be chosen freely so start with an arbitrary conic uh, start with arbitrary five points on it and then try to adjust the other two to make things close up and actually this hints that there are 10 degrees of freedoms and eight of them are eaten up by projective transformations but so there seem to be still two degrees of freedom left that give them uh, gives this thing some kind of flexibility. So in my next experiment, I did the following thing. I changed the construction sequence and I did the following. I have five points on the red conic, one free point here, which is a green one. And from that, I reconstruct the other two red ones. And the only thing I care is that after that, the uh, green points are on a conic. So if I now move that points, you see, well, these points, the other two green points disappear from lying on the conic. And though the question is, if I give you positions for the red points, what is the right position for the green point to lie on a conic? And uh, for that, I was able to work out a construction. You will see them in a, this in a minute. But before that, let me just do a little bit of history on this movability of the configurations. So we have uh, those classical things by Klein and Rigby. And then uh, several years after this uh, starting point for 
considering N4 configurations. So from then on, people were not only considering 21 four configurations, so they were considering also 24 four configurations. For every number of N, they try, tried out, is there an N4 configuration? And at some point, people started are there additional degrees of freedom? And Leah Berman, which is also part of our co-author team, uh, was able in 2006, so it's still again 16 years after the first uh, N4 configurations, uh, real N4 configurations, she was able to discover the first movable thing. So the first thing that ex provably exhibited uh, more degrees of freedom and this looked like that. I don't explain how the construction goes. Uh, then she was able to reduce this number of points. And as far as I know, and it's difficult to nail it down, the best known result before our paper uh, is a construction that is in Grünbaum's book from 2009. Nobody really knows uh, whom to att attribute this construction to uh, because it's in the book and uh, we don't, we, Leah and I, we tried to find out is it by Grünbaum or by someone else. Uh, so the best thing we could find was 25.4. And now it turns out that with our techniques, even the very classical configuration here has some hidden degrees of freedom that people overlooked for the last uh, 35 years. So uh, actually what happened is uh, you had this conjecture of uh, Gabor, which is from this year. And then uh, Leah and I, we independently came up with constructions that actually proved that this is movable. And I want to show you the construction. I want to do it by from scratch. And I don't really, let me stop this screen share here and go to uh, another one. Wait a second, I need just, I prepared that somewhere. Wait a second, ah, here. Uh, so I want to do that construction by from scratch and Please don't ask me to explain why exactly that construction. So uh, it underwent several, uh, well, stages of simplification. So the simplest construction we can do by now looks as follows. So you start with five points. So these five points will be the five points that control your configuration. Then you have to draw a bunch of lines. So you have to draw this line and 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 then you need some lines between the intersections this line and this line and uh, then you need your conic so let me draw the conic here so this is our conic let's make it a red conic here and uh, then you still need a few more lines so you need this, oops, should be a line, not a segment. Then you need this line and this line. And finally, those two points. And I claim those seven points on the conic do the job. So uh, so you see, I can move these points and the, green, uh, the dark red points continue to move as well so let's just check it so uh, let's do the following thing let's hide uh, let's do it a different way uh, let's hide many of those points here and let's just take them as a starting point for green bomb rigby so what do we have to do we have to make well always this skip one thing here so these are the first point, uh, the first lines, and we have to take those points here. I don't care about the coloring for the moment. And then you have to do another skip, uh, which is a skip, skip two, so one, two, skip, one, two, skip. I, in the meantime, exercised a bit to so in 90 percent i can do that without a mistake 
that looks good and now if you take those points and connect them the right way uh, and I think it's this way you see here you get some additional incidences at those points and uh, if I do that all the way around and I do this and I do that and I do that and I do this and that and now I'm through then you see you get those additional incidences here and uh, they actually are the positions of the remaining seven points and this here is the Greenbaum Rigby configuration and this here is the flexibility of the entire beast so it's completely controlled by those five points and completely flexible and well when you have that uh, first of all it's really tricky to find the construction and uh, it needs some really clever heuristics i will come back to that here in in a second uh let's just leave it here and go back to the talk again uh so where are we here we here we are uh so you you see there are i i noted down here two side plots uh so one of the side plots is uh, how to find that construction and it would take uh, another three quarters of an hour to explain how to find that construction. A second side pl uh, plot is how to prove correctness of that construction. So the, the first one actually needs some clever geometric heuristics plus some experience. The second one was first done by brute force mathematical calculations, then was done by more elegant mathematical uh, calculations. And by now we have nice invariant theoretic proofs using bracket algebra. And so everything essentially boils, boils down to four lines of the right algebra that you have to do. But we didn't see that at that point. Um, so let me continue. Now comes this point relation of Porcelet. And that was the point where I contacted Gabor and Gebay because I, I had the impression, okay, I have something and now I need more expertise from, from uh, other sites. And let me do that here. I was playing around with this configuration. So let me go back to that configuration and thought, oh, well, you have all those conics in this uh, drawing. Uh, Let's just see what happens uh, if you take some other other conic. So let me just do the following. Let me select those lines here. So these are seven of the lines and I make the others a bit less visible here. So I focus on so I focused on seven of these lines. You already trust me those, that those six points here, so let's just check it. They, uh, so seven points here lie on a conic as well. So five points determine a conic, by the way. So this here is essentially our green conic here. And But now let's do something different. So I, I started to experiment here. And uh, so let me take a conic defined by five lines. So by this line and this line and come on. This line, this line, this line, this line and one more. And now something amazing happens. So this is tension to five of the lines and it's automatically also tensioned to the others. So you not only have points lying on conics, you also have uh, heptads of lines tangent to conics. And this looks a lot like things that happen in Poncelet theorem. And this will be our next stopping point here. So, and the next image in the talk. Uh, so here I say relation to Poncelet and uh, so you all are geometrists, so you should know Poncelet's theorem. It's something like start with uh, 
points on a conic and start with two conics, start with one point on a conic, draw attention to the other and uh, intersect with the first and tension to the other. I'll do it in a second. Uh, and if things close up, then they will close up more often just some relations so the proofs of these things very often are done via elliptic functions so this is uh, although it's very very early projective geometry it's related to many really deep other fields and in particular it's also related to billiard uh, and playing billiard on an elliptic table and i want to show you both of that so let me just continue with the demo of what happens with Poncelet's theorem so uh, so this is my demo screen for Ponsley's theorem. I have to move that a bit to the side. So this is a game. You have two conics and you start with one point on one of the conics and draw attention to the other. And from there, you take the next intersection and from that intersection here you draw another tangent and then you take that intersection and you, you draw another tangent and you may you you observe here this may close up it may come back to your first point or not so uh well if you change the conics a bit you may get it into a position that they actually meet again. And now the magic happens. If it works for one point that it closes up, it will always close up, no matter with which point you start. And this works for any N and for any zigzag pass. So let me just again play a bit with those parameters and take a bigger N here. So let's zigzag a bit around and say after those steps, we want this thing, oops, to close up and you see it's numerically very sensitive this is the reason why i have a rough slider and a fine slider here and let's make it close up and if it closes up for one position it will always close up and this looks like a rotation and it looks as if it were projectively equivalent these different things it actually is not so it's really uh, something different than projective equivalence let me be a bit more drastic here let's make a five gun here uh, Wait a second. So let's take this here. So I hope you agree optically that what you see here are not projective transformations. That's some, something more weird going on here. And uh, let me briefly at that point mention the relation to billiards. Uh, so here is a billiard table wait a second where's my billiard table here's a billiard table and i take a point and shoot it and what happens here is that the trajectory turns out to produce lines that are tangent to another conic and if it would close up uh well then it would always close up cycling around but also for different points that are adjacent here so let me just slightly vary the parameters so that you see some other cases i i have no idea uh, how it will look like at the end so but now you see the conic in the center a bit more clearly so uh this also so there are many nice proofs of Poncelet's theorem related to elliptical billiards you may wonder what happens if you shoot between those points here, then the following happens. You get another wild curve. And if you wait a while, you see confocal ellipses, uh, hyperbolas appearing here. So it's a, a rich theory, uh, very prominent in the, that community of people who do, do dynamical systems. And uh, this is very related to Poncelet's uh, theorem. And so let me come back to the talk. Uh, wait a second, where's my talk? Always the problem of finding things on your screen. So you, so you got the idea of Poncelet's theorem and uh, this is what, what actually happens at the end. And I don't tell you the proof at that moment uh, that uh, if you start with six points 
that come from uh, the seven points that come from a Poncelet polygon, then on those points you can build up a twenty-one four configuration. So uh, take an arbitrary conic, take six point uh, seven points that qualify to build a Poncelet uh, n-gon, and then you can always close up those points to build a twenty-one four, and actually the movability of the 21.4 comes from the flexibility of the Poncelet theorem, from the fact that you actually can move the Poncelet points. This translates into at least one of the degrees of freedom uh, that you have on the other side. So the idea is you start with Poncelet, whoops. So the idea is you start with Poncelet uh, and gone or seven gone here. And if you have a Poncelet seven gone, you will always get from that a 21.4 configuration. This was the first thing that we wanted to prove. And it took a while. And uh, but here, and I skipped the proof for the moment. I jumped to the next thing. Uh, picture three, more points and more rings. So what you see here is something that does not have three rings of points. It has four rings of points, and the outside are 10 points. So actually, this is a 10, 4, 1, 1, 3, 1, 4, 3, 2 configuration. Because as soon as we had that, we started to write code uh, to experiment with this thing. And I want to show you what happens there. Uh, I have to look. Where do I have that? Too many screens open by now. Uh, ah, okay, here it is. So this here is really a very rough thing. Uh, so what you see here in the center is an n-gon where you can one move one point, and actually here it's a regular n-gon, and here you have a point that you can move and you see now it's iterating and it iterating iteratively finds positions such that you get a Poncelet polygon. And so here now you have, I don't show the conics here, but the, uh, the point that this looks like an N4 configuration here is the optical indication that there is some numerical evidence that it's going right. And then you can play around. Here, here you have your n. Let's not take n is 7. Let's take n is 8. You wait a moment until it stabilizes. And you see the red points become the red points. And everything closes up again. Let's take uh, not 8. Let's take 14. And you wait a moment and it closes up nicely. So there seems to be some much more behind that. So uh, let's take here a 9 and... Uh, Let's take a longer sequence here. So let's take four, one, two, three. Now I have to think a moment. Uh, one, oops, one. Uh, okay, I should have written that down. The one, two, no, one, four, uh, three, two. I explained what I'm doing in a moment. Up, ah, okay, but it still looks nice. So it's still a 9-4 configuration. And so, but now you have more rings. I took a longer sequence. And as long as this sequence here satisfies certain properties, uh, it looked as if it closes up nicely. So it's not only the 21-4, it's much more that you get here. So, uh, let, oops, wait a second, wrong, wrong button. Uh, well, I have, I stopped my presentation here. I have to go again to play slideshow in a window and share screen again. Okay, so we had more points and more rings. And you saw there is some indication. And actually, the theorem is as long as you start with any N, and this ABC sequence is such that the multi-sets of A's and B's that are interleaved here are the same point so that the B's are just some permutation of the A's and no two consecutive letters are identical, then the situation closes up. So you get arbitrary N and an arbitrary 
number of rings and a very flexible combinatorics on all that and so you can create movable n times k4 configurations and still we didn't have any proof of that so it for us it somehow looked like we were traveling and hitting this small iceberg the 21.4 configuration and actually it was like that a big world opened up and we had no idea how to prove it and actually it resisted about three to four months and now we understand what's going on and i don't want to run too much out of time so i'll be a bit brief in what's coming next so um there was this phase where we were desperately in search of proofs for this as we saw very beautiful serum and uh, so this is one picture that actually will not make it in the final publication but this was a very important step in between so here you see the points of an n4 configuration but we highlighted certain points and lines here so the strategy now was somehow to localize what's going on to small incident statements and uh here is uh very localized version so you saw uh in our three rings version so first of all we had a proof that told us if we can do three rings we can get from those three rings to an arbitrary number of rings so there are some nice transversality statements that uh, help to make exactly that and so um so what actually happens you saw there were those conics on which the points lie and conics to which the lines are tangent. And something like the following happens. You start with a point on one conic, draw a tangent to one of the other conics, uh, intersect this. So let's do the colors. Start with blue, draw a tangent to red, intersect with green, and now again to the blue, red, green cycle, draw a tangent to blue, intersect with red, and if you now draw the tangent to green, you will end up at your starting point. If those conics have a certain algebraic condition, don't explain the condition, I explain a difficulty that arises at that point. Um, at every step, uh, you don't have one choice, you have two. So, uh, if you have your point here and you make those tensions there are two possible tensions and if you have the tensions there are two possible intersections and uh, so you have these six steps so you have all together 64 possibilities and exactly eight of them lead to an incident statement and the other don't lead to anything and uh, it was some kind of very problematic to find what what is the right criterion? And then the following observation turned out to be crucial and turned everything around once more. So if you take a configuration that closes up and you consider the touching points, then those three touching points are collinear and the line that connects them is again tangent to another conic that somewhere sits in the center. And now, uh, this helped us to find uh, a different construction. But before I do that, I have to tell you something about Poncelet grids. So, so far we saw only Poncelet polygons. And uh, so here in that picture, in the very center, you have a Poncelet polygon and you have all the supporting lines. And now take the intersections of all those lines here and take all those intersections then it happens that these points here of intersections again lie on conics and this whole structure here is called a poncelet grid and it's very important for those people doing discrete differential geometry uh, because it has some really nice metric and incidence properties and so on and so on so uh, the main theorem about poncelet grids is uh, that these points lie on rings of conics and these conics are codependent what i mean by codependent is that their duals are e dependent in terms of equations so in other words all these Conics that you see here have common tangents, four common tangents. You don't see them in that picture because they are complex. Uh, 
So you have a very weird interplay between real and complex, but uh, this is the projective statement. At that point, the community divides a bit. There are those people like me who pre prefer a completely projective setup. But there are also the other people who say, why do we have our life difficult if all that what we are doing is already equivalent to something nicely real? Before I show that, uh, just one, one mention, uh, this, is, was, this was already known to Dabo, and there are some very nice paper by Rich Schwartz and Sergei Tabachnikov in the recent years uh, on those Ponsel Lakrits, which go way deeper. And uh, so for me, this is projective in nature, but for many other people, this is Euclidean in nature by moving them to a position where all these uh, conics become confocal. So this codependent is projectively equivalent to being a set of confocal conics. So up to projective equivalence, you can move the situation to this picture where you have your two foci approximately here and here, and all the conics of the Poncelet grid are confocal to them. And uh, this allows you to play billiard on these conics and make some of the proofs much easier. And uh, again, I skip a few thoughts and come to the next picture, which is somehow a construction that produces a 21 or an N4 configuration, but more or less starting from a completely different point. So the idea is first draw something that at the end will not belong to your configuration, but uh, ensures that you have the right incidences of other elements that you construct. So here's a full construction. I will start from scratch and here's what we do. We start with the points of a Poncelet polygon and draw the segments of that polygon. So here in the inner part, they're sitting a Poncelet polygon and you draw all that lines and Poncelet crit theorem tells you that these uh, points are supported by conics. Now you do the following. You take three of those conics. So here a red one, a green one, and a blue one. And you take the tangents to those points at the conics. And it turns out, if you take these tangents and draw the full lines that you get here, so here are the full lines that you get there, it turns out that these are the lines of uh, N4 configuration. So if you look at this thing, so forget about the black lines here, the colored lines and the colored points will form an N4 configuration. And the reason for that is that these lines here intersect in quadruples. So, uh, so let me localize that. So actually what you ultimately have to prove is something that looks as follows. Uh, you just focus on four of those tangents here that come from a Poncelet n-gon and take these conics that support them and take the tangents to those conics. And if the combinatorics was done right, then these things will meet in a point. And those, the, these four lines meeting in a point uh, will be applied over and over and over and all in all give you your n4 configuration. So everything boiled out, boiled down to proving that lemma. Uh, so you have three conics of a Poncelet grid. You have four points on the outer conics such that the connections here are tangent to the inner conic. Then these tensions that you can move here will meet in a point. And this theorem is nice and small and localized, but it's a beast as well. I've never seen a serum with so many false statements about it in the literature. So there are some small non-degeneracy conditions that people overlook, and we're still looking for the most elegant proof of that. And uh, so one way of thinking about it is that in the confocal world, it turns out that this intersection point here is an in-circle 
of the four tangents. So if you move everything to the nice billiard configuration, then you can prove that. And actually, you can prove that by billiard arguments. I won't do that uh, for the moment. Uh, and perhaps this here is the best picture where you also take one more conic into the game and actually two more lines. And this is a full picture of what's going on. And uh, based on that, we now can formulate a nice proof of all the chain of what we are doing except for that. Um, but still, we're looking for the most elegant proof of that. And as I said, the community divides. So there are those people who are happy with doing everything in the Euclidean way. And you can go give a billiard approach, but it has a disadvantage that uh, this approach only applies to nested ellipses. And it's difficult to transfer that into a setting where also some of them are hyperbolas and projectively there is some more behind that. Then we have a nice almost proof uh, using the kelly bacharach theorem. Uh, I say almost proof because we have to exclude one nasty special case and we were not able to exclude it yet, but this would be a nice and purely projective setup for that. Then you can do brute force calculation. This is ugly, but it works. And I have a three pages proof of what we need with some kind of calculations, which are not so ugly, but still some kind of unsatisfactory. Or you can just try to find it somewhere in the literature. But actually, we didn't find a perfect source that matches exactly what we need. So this is currently, so most probably in the paper, we will use the billiard approach with some link that there are also more general calculations. And I don't want to uh, explain what's going on here. But in the very end, so this is the last picture now, uh, I want to show you that, uh, which is a kind of holistic view of the entire thing that comes from the following observation. If you have the lines of uh, Poncelet grid, then, uh, and you moved everything to a situation where you really have this confocal conics, then you will find many, many, many in circles here. So there are uh, complete papers just about these in circle nets that appear here. And actually you will not only find those in circles here, you will also find in circles of supercells. And as soon as those two such circles share the same two tensions, their se uh, centers will be collinear. And this is from where, uh, from which you could get the collinearity of what we need. And so if you look here, also if you take cells of a larger grid width, uh, they also have such in circles. And then you can build up many collinearities. And if you just take the right three rings of such in-circles, they are points of the in-circles, the centers of the in-circles will give you an N4 configuration. And a very nice and holistic view to everything. And so this is currently perhaps the most elegant way to construct these things. Let me end just three more minutes uh, with a couple of open questions. Uh, I, didn't mention that, but a uh, big part is uh, I showed you the construction for the seven gone. We can also construct the eight gone, the 10 gone, the 12, 14, and so on. So actually we can do all that here exactly. Uh, and more or less that's all we can do. And I, I guess you cannot get much more. So I have the following conjecture. So uh, up to eight, and this is a little bit surprising. You can do everything with ruler and compass if you want. Those higher things here, you need uh, intersection between two conics. And I'm pretty convinced that you could do this one here also with, uh, by intersecting conics. Uh, but for all the others, you should need solve equations of degree five or higher which will not be uh, doable by elementary geometric means. So this is one, one of the open branches. The best proof for our lemma is another of the open branches. And to understand the full realization space, space of those configurations is another interesting point because we're pretty sure we just uh, 
highlighted uh, uh, substructure in the realization space, but the re realization space is, itself is way richer than we get what we get here. Just a few loose ends. You could also talk about configurations of conics and points and getting some interesting things. Uh, you could aim for more than the four here. So this here is actually a uh, movable N6 configuration. So you have uh, actually here in that configuration, it's 120 lines and 120 points and it's movable and through each point you have six lines and on each line you have six points uh, this is a, an amazing construction by leah uh, which actually uh, in, in that it works uh, what you see here is some of the lines form a disarc configuration and actually you have 10 orbits of points 10 orbits of lines and you could consider the entire thing as a rotated this arc configuration, but it works together with our Poncelet construction. You could also think about something like infinity, oh, it should be a four here, infinity four configurations, which open another world into logarithmic spiral. So, and I think at that point, I talked enough and thanks for your attention.